PMI insurance helps you get that loan. So it's based on um, how much you're putting down, how what your credit score is, um, and what the term of the loan is. And so your PMI on a conventional loan can be taken off once you've paid that loan down to 20%. I personally have a, a conventional loan because I wanted to avoid paying the private mortgage insurance. So um, a minimum down payment on a conventional loan is usually about 5%, but there are 3% um, uh, conventional loan programs um, for you. Government loans are insured or guaranteed by the government, and there's basically two types, VA, and that is um, a very good program for our veterans who have either served in the military or are still in the military. And the great thing about a VA loan is that you don't have to put a down payment. Um, there's no PMI, there's no monthly PMI, but there is a VA funding fee. Now, if you have any kind of service-connected disability, meaning that you maybe had an injury um, it, when you were serving, or maybe you have a hearing loss, you have any kind of service-connected rating that the VA said there's some kind of medical um, disability, then you do not have to pay a VA funding fee. So if you're a veteran, you ought to ask Amy about a VA home loan because it's a, it is a super good program for our veterans. FHA, Federal Housing Administration, was created in, in the 60s to help people in the United States be able to afford a home. Not everybody had 5 10% down. So it is a uh, program that uh, the minimum down payment is three and a half percent. That down payment can be a gift. The guidelines are a lot easier. I had an FHA loan and it was really easy to refinance when the interest rates went down from 12 percent. I think I refinanced my FHA loan three times. But there is a mortgage insurance premium, upfront mortgage insurance premium, as well as a monthly MIP. Um, Sellers can pay up to 6% of the closing costs on an FHA loan. So these there's many programs for you um, to qualify to buy a mortgage. Do you need money in today's world? I just heard a loan officer in my office talking to a customer saying, you know, sellers are less, less uh, willing to pay closing costs. That doesn't mean that they won't pay them, but you do need money in most cases when you're buying a house in today's market. Now, your down payment will be based on the program that you're participating in. If you have a conventional loan, normally the down payment would be 5%. We're gonna use our $100,000 example because for illustrative purposes, because it's, it's easy to understand. Um, $100,000 uh, uh, house, we're putting 5% down, which would be $5,000 and we'd lend you $95,000. So $95,000 divided into the sales price of $100,000 would be a 95% loan-to-value ratio. So the LTV is kind of a good thing for you to understand. You can talk to Amy and say, well, you know, Amy, um, what would your rate be if I put 10% down and I had a 90% LTV? So that's how we calculate your down payment. In doing this class for many years, what I have found is there's a lot of terms that the average person just doesn't really know what those companies do or what those terms are. A title company is one of the ones that can be confusing. And basically, a title company is just a company that specializes in um, researching the chain of title. They are going to see if there's any liens or encumbrances or any type of uh, defects in the chain of title, if there's any long lost relatives that maybe uh, could claim um, the property. And so then they issue what we call title insurance. And that insurance uh, will cover the lender. Um, we have to have what we call a lender's policy or a, a mortgagee's title policy. You do not have to have a mortgagor's title policy. However, it's customary for the seller to purchase uh, an owner's policy, also known as an owner's policy. I highly suggest that you get a title policy. We have to have one because our investors won't buy our loan without it. Um, but I highly suggest that you get one for, for an owner's policy. And the reason is if there is a problem with the chain of title and you want to be sure that you're um, that you have some type of recourse with the title company um, because they would have to make it good if they made a mistake on the chain of title on the title insurance. So uh, it, it, you might want to ask your uh, 
your escrow agent at the title company, your loan will close at the title company and you'll be assigned an escrow agent will, will explain all of the paperwork to you and just ask them, well, what does the title insurance cover? Should I get that? But just know that it's a really good thing for you, you to get. There's typical loan closing costs with most loans. You'll have your lender fees, your admin processing underwriting, third party fees such as the mortgagees title policy we just discussed, appraisal fees, credit report, flood zone certification, attorney's fees, um, survey fees, and then we have escrow fees for taxes and insurance on PMI and, and mortgage insurance. So you'll the lender uh, will t will give closing instructions to the title company and they'll collect um, three months worth of taxes, three months worth of insurance so that we have a sort of a cushion in your uh, escrow account to pay the taxes and insurance. Um, you'll pay prepaid interest, uh, first year's insurance, and then your escrow account set up. So you really have kind of two options on the prepaid interest. So when we close your loan, the clock starts ticking with the interest. So you, it, interest starts accruing as soon as the loan closes. So a lot of people like to close at the end of the month because what we do is we collect interest from the day that your loan closes to the first of the next month. So if you closed on May 30th, for example, then you just have one day worth of insurance. You'd be paying your in, our interest through June 1st, and then your next payment would be July 1. Option two would be uh, where you're closing at the beginning of the month. Say it's June 1st, we get 30 days worth of interest, and then you wouldn't make a payment until August 1st. You end up paying the same amount, but um, just so you know what prepaid interest is. So the, the escrow account set up at the title company um, is going to be it is going to collect three months worth of taxes and insurance. So if your taxes, just for simplification purposes, were twenty four hundred dollars a year divided by twelve, then two hundred dollars a month would be um, towards your taxes. Let's say your insurance premium, your homeowner's insurance, is twelve hundred dollars a month. That would be divided by twelve would be a hundred dollars. Uh, towards your payment. So the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act limits the lenders from keeping more of a cushion than three months. And if they have more than three months worth of cushion, they have to, to reimburse that to you. So your escrow accounts, how they work is the, the lender is going to tell the title company, collect this cushion at closing, and then every month when you make your payment, you'll pay one twelfth of your taxes and one twelfth of your insurance. So it's very important to know what are the taxes on this property and your realtor will be able to give you that information. Um, also, you can call your um, insurance agent and when you have decided what property you're interested in, give them the address and they'll ask you a few questions about the construction of the home and they can give you an idea of what your um, your insurance would be. Your bills are sent directly for your insurance and taxes directly to the lender. And I really like that because I don't want to have to worry about paying my taxes and insurance. Um, they will send you an annual escrow analysis and that analysis will tell you when your taxes were paid, how much they were, when your insurance was paid, and then they'll recalculate your payment. Uh, sometimes your payment will go up, sometimes it'll go down. I know one time in uh, during the mortgage meltdown of 2009, my, the tax rate did not go down on my property, uh, but the value of my property went down. So that caused my total taxes to go down and caused my total payment uh, to go down. And conversely, this year when I got my uh, escrow analysis, the taxes had gone up because the value went up um, quite a bit in today's world. It's They're going up. Um, escrow shortages. Um, so that's what I mean when I say escrow shortages. If they, instead of say, coming to you and saying, we don't have enough money in your escrow account to pay your taxes and insurance, they will just increase your payment um, to cover that and you pay it uh, over the remainder, re remaining months of the year. So they can increase, your payment can increase and decrease depending on what the taxes and insurance are doing. Escrowing is pretty much a requirement on a government loan. Um, on a conventional loan, you are allowed to self-escrow, which means you can pay your own taxes and insurance. Um, 
The lender uh, obviously is going to take care, care of paying the taxes and insurance on the escrowed loan. So it doesn't require a lot of discipline. The self escrow, you have less cash out at closing because we don't have to collect that three month cushion, but you're responsible for providing proof of payment um, to the lender and um, uh, your your payment will be lower because you won't have that pro rata share of that one twelfth of your insurance and one twelfth of your taxes included in in that payment. But those loans are riskier for the investors, and so most investors are going to charge an escrow waiver fee, and you need to know what that is. Normally, it'll be a quarter point of the loan because when people stop making their payments and they're self escrowing, paying their own taxes and insurance, they usually will stop paying their um, their taxes and insurance as well. So let's talk uh, a little loan lingo about rates and points. Rates are determined by the return that the investors want, uh, the yield that they want to make. And um, the and they make that, that income or that yield in the form of the rate and points. So the only reason that you would want to pay points, and this is the only reason, is if you're trying to buy your loan down. Unfortunately, I have known um, customers with, not us, but unscrupulous lenders that um, will charge their, their home buyer points for, for a PAR rate. And PAR, PAR rate means you're not receiving any credit from that rate, nor are you having to pay for that rate. And so in our example, and these are not current rates, of a $100,000 loan at six and a half, if maybe you were short on closing costs, Amy could put call premium price alone, charge a little bit higher interest rate. And in this example, it's one point, which would be 1% 1 of 100,000, which would be $1,000 towards your closing costs at six and a half percent. At 6.375 in the example, that would be a half a percent, $500 towards your closing costs. The par rate at six and a quarter, you don't pay for it and you're not getting a credit towards your closing costs. So when you're talking to Amy, you can say, well, what's your par rate today? And she will know what you're talking about. Uh, to get a lower rate, we call that a discounted rate, you pay points. Um, so in this example, 6.125 would be uh, half a point that you would pay, which would be uh, $500 to get it down to 6.125. To get it to 6% in this example, you pay one point, $1,000 uh, in discount points. So what we want to know is, well, if I pay $1,000 to get the rate down to, a th to, to 6%, how much am I saving compared to the par rate? In this example, uh, the principal and interest payment, the difference is from the six to six and a quarter is $16 a month. So then you want to know how long does it take to uh, recoup that sixteen uh, that thousand dollars, and how many months is it going to take? So in this example, it will take you about sixty three months to of, of that sixteen dollars a month to recoup your thousand um, dollars. That's five years. Is that a good deal? Probably not. So let Amy talk to you about what might be a good strategy as far as paying points. So basically, the longer you want to live in the house, if this is your dream home, the more you care about your interest rate. So you want to get your estimates in writing. Um, the pricing, the lower the fees with premium pricing, the higher your interest rate. In other words, uh, we can charge a little bit higher interest rate and pay some of those fees for you, but you want to make sure when you're talking to lenders that they're actually giving you the information in writing. And you know, one thing I love about the credit union model is in all of their products, for that matter, whether it's a car loan or a credit card, is the credit union is designed to try to help you uh, go through life and get what you need uh, without getting without getting gouged or getting ripped off. Uh, the lower your rate, the higher the discount points would be, and so the more out-of-pocket expenses. Your payment's going to include principal interest taxes, insurance, and that monthly PMI if that is necessary. Now, on a conventional loan only, uh, on an FHA loan, you're going to be paying that mortgage insurance premium uh, for the life of the loan. 
um, and you can't get that back. Um, on a conventional loan, once you pay it down 20% to 80% loan to value ratio, then you can ask the servicer to remove that monthly PMI for you and that'll save you a lot of money. Uh, you have to do that in writing. It has to it has to still be appraising out. And so I understand that a BPO, uh, most servicers will accept a BPO, which is a broker's price opinion. And that is a real estate broker uh, that has uh, given you a written opinion. It's 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 kind of well known in the in, in the industry what a BPO is. And 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 you will give that to the servicer um, if you're making your payments, if you've been making your payments. Uh, then they can remove that PMI. Once it comes to goes down to 78%, the law requires the lender to take that off on owner-occupied homes. Now, I want to say that um, it, if you're, I know it was very stressful when I first got my my first loan to buy my first house. Um, really, just believe that you can accomplish your goals. Um, and if you'll do what your loan officer says, even if you're not ready right now, you can get yourself, Amy can help you get yourself to a situation where you're able to buy a house. And we're concentrating on four different things when we're underwriting your loan. Underwriting meaning we're assessing the risk on your loan, your credit, uh, your assets to close, how much you have in savings, the income and the amount of the income in the property itself. What is the condition of the property? How much is the uh, property appraising for? If you do have credit problems, just go to annualcreditreport.com and you can pull a credit report for free. You will not be hurting your credit score when you pull a credit report. Um, Amy, is she has such good information about what you can do to improve your credit score. It's amazing how quickly you can improve your credit score. Everybody has a minimum uh, FICO, it's usually 600 to 620, the higher amount of loan you want, the higher the credit score has to be. So Amy can tell you what it would be for the product that you're looking for. Credit scores um, are not free when you go to annualcreditreport.com. I personally don't think you need to pull your credit scores because there are all types of different models under the FICO scoring model. I just took a class on this and mortgage bankers like Amy use a different repository. They use a different model. Um, and so what you get uh, on Credit Karma as your FICO score or what it says on your Discover card bank statement, uh, it's not going to be the same as what Amy has. And she will give you those. And when you apply for a loan, one of the first things Amy's going to do is give you all three of your FICO scores from TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax. Um, so FICO scores aren't the sole determinant of whether or not you get the loan, but the investors have to have some way to assess the risk. Um, so they all have a minimum FICO. 35% uh, of that FICO score is how you pay your debt. So just keep on paying your credit cards, pay a little bit more um, than the minimum, pay ahead of time. Um, and then the 30% of your FICO score is the amount you owe. So the lower you keep your balance, uh, that the better your FICO score will be. So let's say you have a $10,000 limit on your credit card. You might want to try to keep it $3,000 or lower. Um, I try to pay mine off because it improves my credit score and I just don't, I just don't, I've been there, done that, don't want to have any credit, don't want to have any debts if I don't have to. 10% new credit, 10% of uh, the types of credit. For some reason, the model is not crazy about furniture uh, loans or in, uh, some types of installment loans. So just talk with Amy if you really need to um, borrow money during the application process. It's a good idea not, not to take out new, new credit. Uh, um, so 10% is types of credit you use, and then 15% is the length of the, your credit history. So the longer you have FICO score, the better off you are. Sources of funds can come from pretty much anything you can think of, checking savings, gifts from relatives, as long as it's documented appropriately, uh, 401k loan, sale of a residence, sale of any kind of stocks or bonds or a borrowing against your 401k plan. So as a general rule, what we do is we calculate what we call your debt ratio. 
and we are going to be taking your total monthly obligations and dividing that into your gross income. Gross income meaning your income, your monthly income without any deductions or your uh, taxes or any type of deductions at all. And Amy's going to divide that in, in uh, your monthly obligations into your gross monthly income. And she'd like to see 38% or lower. Uh, however, I would like to qualify that statement by saying that we do loans over 38% all the time. So your loan to value ratio is determined by the lower of the sales price or the appraised value. So once we get the appraised value, let's say your contract um, is for a $300,000 house, but it didn't appraise for $300,000, then we have to base the, uh, uh, the loan on the lower of the sales price or the appraised value. So if it didn't if it didn't appraise out for the sales price, then we'd have to base our loan on that appraised value. And that appraised value is based on comparable sales that the um, appraiser has found of like type properties that you wish to purchase, the homes that, that are similar to the home that you wish to purchase. And um, they come up with the value based on what properties are selling for in the area. So from start to finish, you're going to get pre-approved. You're going to pre-qualify, um, and then once we, you can you can do the lock and shop, um, and you're finding a house. You want to work with a realtor that is is good because a good realtor that has a a good name in the community is just worth its weight in gold. So in a seller's market, you want to use someone that you really like. If you do not enjoy the person that you're working with move on to someone else and there are some strategies for buying a home in a seller's market i looked up some information that i wanted to briefly go over with you on uh, uh, the state of texas as well as bear county the state of texas has 1.3 months worth of inventory now that's gone up it will last month uh, i'm excuse me this is for april 1.3 months they're about a month behind 1.1 months in March. So we're seeing 0.2 months worth of inventory. So it's gone up a little bit. The median sales price in Texas is $350,000. Um, the average is 432. In Bear County, the median is 325,000 and there's 4,668 houses available for sale. So if you're in a bigger community, if you're in a large metropolitan area, you have more properties available. So it's not quite as, as, um, as hard as it is on someone like me who I'm in Bell County in Belton, which is in central Texas and we have 0.4 months worth of inventory. So if you're in a bigger city, you have a little bit more opportunity to um, to shop and and uh, negotiate. But there are some strategies that you can use to um, negotiate or to help you get your contract accepted. Get a pre-approval. Um, that's the number one thing that uh, experts say is go ahead and get a pre-approval uh, because the realtors, the listing agents know that that means that you've proven to the loan officer and to the underwriter that you actually can qualify for a loan. Use a lender that that uh, like SWBC that has a good um, reputation in the community. So if Amy issues a pre-approval letter, she is the, the other uh, agents listing agents know that that loan is uh, probably going to close as long as it appraises out um, you might want to use a strategy to go under budget like um, bid on a house that maybe is under your budget because if you have to if you're in a competitive market you might have to bid more um, that's what we're seeing um, nationally not only in in texas but nationwide you can do things like offer to lease the house back to the seller, um, have a shorter option period. Um, and normally it used to be a 10 day option, which would give you time to have an inspector look at that house and check it over and see if there's maybe anything wrong with it. During the option period, if for any reason you decide you don't want to buy the house, then you can get your option uh, money back. Um, your, or, excuse me, you can get your earnest money back. Another strategy to get your offer accepted is to, to deposit more earnest money, do, do a larger uh, amount of earnest money. And you can ask your real estate agent what is customary for the area, and um, they can tell you 
uh, what what a, a good amount of earnest money would be. Uh, buy as is without asking for a lot of repairs if you're in a seller's market. Um, and then have your have your lender, have Amy call the listing agent and tell them what a great credit risk you are. Amy can verify the funds that you have um, to close to make sure that they understand that this deal is going to close and she can advocate on behalf of your of your application. Um, so once you get your contract accepted, you want to research your insurance because there's a lot of difference between insurance companies. Uh, I have been with, I won't name the company, but I've been with this company, insurance company for like 40 years. And when I bought my house uh, April of last year, they were going to charge me more money per month. It was like $35 a month more. And then they wanted a $5,000 deductible, which they didn't even explain to me. So if something happens to my house and I have to make a claim, I have to pay $5,000 out of pocket. That's not good. So I was able to work with another insurance uh, company and get a $1,000 deductible from a very reputable company and, um, and, and get better coverage. And, you know, $1,000 deductible and my premium was lower. So you're, you'd be surprised how much difference there is in insurance companies. So as soon as you find out what house you're going to buy, call the company that you're paying your auto insurance, and then um, uh, Amy can give you some num names of some insurance companies so you can start researching that. And that can take uh, quite a bit of uh, time. Get an inspection. Uh, the inspector may find some things that would trigger a renegotiation of the contract. Uh, you do not have to have an inspection. The lender doesn't even really want to see it, but that, it's a good idea to get an inspection so that you can see, you know, what what the condition of the property is. Uh, we'll get the appraisal. Uh, the appraiser may have some lender required repairs. Get clear title. We'll get clear title to the property. We'll order a survey. We don't want to charge anyone for a survey until we have our appraisal back. And then we'll re-verify your cash to close employment uh, and we'll recalculate your credit ratio. So please not try, you know, a lot of people think that they don't have to, they can just go out and charge furniture or do, you know, get new credit cards because they're, ooh, I'm already, I'm already qualified, but be very careful about that. Don't do anything until your loan's closed. Uh, so how to prepare for the closing. Um, if you, the easiest way is to elect to agree to accept information from us electronically, just like you do your bank or any type of credit card. So you go into a secured site, and you have a passcode and then when your loan is getting ready to close we'll send you a closing disclosure a cd and um, we are required to give you three business days to look at that closing disclosure to see if you have any kind of questions and we have to track that so once you get an email from us um, uh, you click on that email be sure and go and click on it and that will tell us that you uh, have received the closing disclosure and that three days will start uh, the ticking uh, so it will resemble a loan estimate. It shouldn't be very far off. We're not allowed to get to make very many mistakes on that closing disclosure. So uh, pro the processor is going to be submitting the file to the closer. Uh, the closer is going to give information to the escrow agent, closing instructions to the escrow officer. That person will call you and say, hey, what time can you come in? We need about an hour's worth of time. Some of them have uh, mobile notaries that can come to your office. Um, and then they'll calculate how much you need to bring to closing. And they'll ask you either to wire that money or to send certified funds. You get the keys to your house. Usually I know what happened with me is I closed on a Friday at 430. They gave me the closing disclosure. I went over, I bought a new house. So I took that over to the sales office and they gave me the keys to my house. So your escrow officer is going to give you a first payment letter. Sometimes you don't get um, you don't get a uh, there's a time lag between the closing of your loan and when it sets gets set up with the servicer so you'll you'll get that information where to make your first payment and when when the first payment is due and now i'm going to turn it over to amy amy tell us all about the benefits of starting your home buying experiment experience with first mark i will do, I will it. do it thank you so much thank you tammy you always do such a great job thank we you. Appreciate you well hello everyone i'm amy i am the loan officer that will be 
assisting you through this process. Um, first, I just want to thank you for being here, and I want to tell you that First Mark, very much our focus is on you. Our focus is on the member and what can we do to assist the member? How can we make improvements for you, go through this process with you? We want to have this be a smooth process for you. We want you comfortable. We want to be your partner from start to finish. Um, we want to walk with you through this home buying journey. So it's it's very, very important that you understand you are the reason we get up and go to work every day. So thank you for giving us this opportunity. You're going to start with the counseling that we offer you. That is me. That is my position and my role is to explain the process to you, answer all of your questions. I want to be that person for you. So please, please don't hesitate. Um, this this can seem like an overwhelming process, but it doesn't have to be an overwhelming process. Your partner will make all the difference for you. Um, our mortgage team that's dedicated to First Mark member loans um, will handle your loan with complete expertise, a lot of professionalism, start to finish. Our application is done electronically. That is for your security. We have a platform called Turnkey. It is very, very secure. Just in the nature of our business, you, you must realize how secure things have to be just because of the documents that we deal with are very personal documents. So we take it very seriously and our, our software is designed with all of that in mind. Um, like Tammy said, I recommend getting a pre-approval letter. This time last year, everyone had pre-qualification letters. That was sufficient. That was that was all that was expected. That was standard operating procedure. Well, this year is not last year. Well, this is a different market and everyone needs to be more prepared and take any additional steps they can take to be uh, the standout buyer. And one way that we are helping you do that is by pre-approving you. We will get your pay stubs from you. We will get your W-2s. We will get your bank statements and we will put a file together and we will present it to an underwriter and we will get you approved even though we don't have a house yet. And then once you find that house, we just slip the house into the file, do a quick review and we're ready to go. Lock and shop is something that's new. Um, again, this time not too long ago, you had to have a property under contract before you could lock in your interest rate. Um, SWBC and First Mark were always looking for new ways to be competitive and to help you all have a competitive edge. And lock and shop is what we've come up with, and that enables you to lock in your interest rate now before you find a house. You do have to pre um apply excuse me you do have to apply you have to have a complete loan file um, and we we can do lock and shop and that will protect you from rates going up while you're trying to find a house um, so that is something that we can talk about we also first mark and swbc we have a program called blend realty you really should have a realtor. One thing some people do not realize is that realtors are actually free. Realtors are free for buyers. It is typically the seller that's, that pays the realtor. So there's not a lot of reason to skip having a realtor. All they do is real estate transactions all day, every day. That's what they do. So why not use that expertise to assist you in your process that maybe maybe you haven't done this before and they are the experts on the real estate front well we have a program where we will pair you with a realtor so i'm saying you should have a realtor i'm saying a realtor is free for you but i'm also going to tell you that with our real estate concierge our realtors actually will pay you so if you're going to have a realtor why not have one that pays you? And we've already vetted them. We've already 
check them out. They're top notch, cream of the crop, full time realtors that know exactly what they're doing. They're high performing, high octane, ready to back you up and take you down the road to get you into a home. Um, the rebate for an example, this actually is a, a typo, so don't pay any attention to what that says there. That's a mistake. It's actually 0.5%. And so on a $300,000 house, that's $1,500. You got to have a realtor anyway. Why not have one that pays you? Um, but the, the most important message that I want to say, everything that we've talked about tonight I'm here for you always to talk to you individually one on one. We can make an appointment and have a phone appointment and um, we can communicate via email. You can apply online and I'll call you and discuss your application. But just understand that you have resources available to you and that is why we are here and it's what we love to do and, and we look forward to helping you. Thank you, Amy. You're welcome. Okay. Here's Amy's information if ever anybody needs it. Yes, thank you both Amy and Tammy. Uh, this was a great presentation. I do have some questions. So we got looks like we have a little bit of time for some questions that came through the chat feature. And for those of you that joined us a little late, uh, we will have a recorded session. We'll send that out to you. But also know that you can type your questions in the chat feature. There's a little bubble if you look for there's a little call out on the team site wherever you have your uh, toolbar you can look for it and it said there's a chat feature in there so you can just type your question so a couple of questions that came through and i'll start with a softball here throw uh, <laughs> <laughs> first one is like how long is the pre-approval good for amy it is good for 120 days Excellent. OK, at the end of 120 days, you do not have to start everything over. We just have to pull a new credit report. That's when the credit expires. OK, and then uh, so, you know. Tammy, you talked about this and, you know, market is one point four months of what's available in, in the housing market. You know, a lot of us are having to hear about people bidding over the house. And one of the, the responses from one of the guests is like they've even heard of 100,000. I've heard of concessions where they even give uh, season tickets or tickets to one <laughs> of their, you know, they're just trying everything. They're letting them stay in the home, you know, rent free for the next three months until they buy another home. And so there's just all these things that they're doing because the inventory is so low. And, uh, you know, any any ideas that y'all can provide or any uh, support that, you know, that that uh, lets our, our participants know what what they can do to get their home that they're wanting to purchase? Well, first of all, um, I'll start out, Amy, and then you jump, jump me, jump in there if you can think of anything else. Um, I know that the the realtors that Amy has are scrubbed. And so they have to have closed so many loans or and they they have to be experienced. So have a discussion with your realtor. What is the months of inventory in this particular neighborhood? Uh, what what are you seeing? Are you seeing and she she or he can give you comparable sales uh, and they can also give you not only comparable sales, but what houses are selling for right now. And so in my neighborhood, it's crazy how in one month that, the, you know, the price appreciation might be even 10,000 in one month, which is kind of crazy. So talk to your realtor about what is the market doing in that neighborhood and have an idea of how much over you're willing to go. And this is very tricky because we don't want to pay. I don't want to pay a hundred thousand dollars. You know, I want to, I, I want to don't want to lose any money on my house that I buy. So you have to have a really good seasoned realtor can walk you through that. Um, also, it's very important for your loan officer for you to work with a loan officer, not just a Internet lender who or there's some companies you can't even talk to a loan officer. <laughs> some of these banks, you don't even know who you're working with. So you need a loan officer like Amy that that can call the listing agent and, and say, look, 
this customer has the money to do this deal. This customer is highly qualified. Um, I'm really good at what I do. She can sell you um, and, and she's more than willing to do that. So good loan officer that will call and, and advocate. Also have a conversation with the realtor and say, I love this house and have your realtor advocate on your behalf by calling the listing agent and saying, my customers love this house. And sometimes you'll be, you'll have a veteran that you're representing and you talk about the veterans military service, especially in San Antonio, they have a lot of veteran owners. And um, one of the ladies in my house or uh, in my office, she sold her rental house to veterans and she had multiple offers. So I said, Cheney, why did you sell it to a veteran? I'm just you know, wondering why? Because my grandfather is a veteran, my father is a veteran, you know, all my family members are veterans. I love the idea that that veteran is going to be living in my house and will take care of the yard and so on and so forth. So you never know who you're, who the seller is. So be sure that your agent is, is not going to sit back, that they're going to call the listing agent and have a conversation. This is a veteran. They served in Iraq or they, did this and advocate on your behalf. Um, if you really want that house, you can waive the, you can waive your option and say, I'll just buy this house as is. So you need to be thinking about what is it that I can do? Uh, in my case, I'm not handy. So I, I need a, <laughs> you know, I need a house that works, but some people are. And so they're willing to say, take the seller off the hook. Oh, you don't have to fix that house. Amy, can you think of other things? I think that you are correct that a lot of people are taking on a more personal approach. I've had people write letters saying, you know, I can't wait for my kids to play in the backyard and you're kind of tugging on the personal heartstrings. <laughs> um, but it, it it's again, it just goes back to our suggestion that you have a realtor. A realtor is going to be your, your best gauge for the market, what to expect, what's happening, what's been happening, what's expected to happen, um, what's currently uh, going on in the market as it relates to pricing and uh, availability. Also, having a realtor in the area. For example, if, you, if you're trying to buy a house in northeast San Antonio, don't use a northwest realtor, is my opinion. Because the listing agents, if they know that other realtor, it it just I, it just helps if they know the realtor's rep, reputable and easy to work with. Because realtors are just humans, and some of them are better than others. Some of them are just doing it part time, which I don't suggest using a part time realtor. I Use someone that does it for a living that's really good at it. Yeah. Yeah, another good reason to when you do apply, there is a question in there whether you are working with a realtor and if you're not, you can answer no and then we actually uh, refer you over to the concierge service and you will get to actually get a realtor that's in your market. So they know the market. They've uh, been vetted, like Amy said, they've already there. They do this full time. They've been doing it. They have a lot of great Google review, reviews, Yelp reviews, Zillow reviews. So it's someone that is uh, highly, uh, you know, ready for you to, to get you that home that you need. Let me see if I can throw this one in there real quick, Amy. It's just a, there was a question about information on a short arm mortgage loan. Uh, we do arm mortgage loans here, and do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, we offer a five five arm that is amazing. Um, so um, arms are coming back. That's that's the way people are heading right now because they have lower introductory rates. Um, they do adjust, so there is some risk with adjustment, but um, you will know going in what could happen worst case scenario so there are no surprises um, but yes we offer arm loans okay let me throw this one in there too what about rates could you i mean that that's very uh loaded question because it just <laughs> depends on the on the lt it depends on a very variable of things right so what 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 would you say when somebody calls and asks you what are what are your rates i I actually don't answer that question <laughs> just like that. I need more information. Um, so here's here's an example. Um, if you walked onto a car lot and said, I want to buy a car, they're going to ask you a lot of questions. Do you need a two-door or a four-door? 
Do you need a four cylinder or a six cylinder or an eight cylinder? How many passengers do you carry around with you? Do you, you know, all of the standard or automatic? I mean, these are all things that are that are things that determine what kind of car you're going to look at. It's a very similar thing with interest rates. What is your credit score? How much money will you be putting down? Are you doing a 15 year loan or a 30 year loan? Are you doing an arm or are you doing a fixed rate? Um, so there, there are lots of pieces to that puzzle. Yes, we can get to an answer, but it's not, it's not just a number on a screen that can be shared. Excellent. Every, everybody does not get the same rate because everybody is a different picture. Right, right. Well, thank you everybody for attending today's webinar. We really appreciate your attendance. And like I said, we will be sending out the recorded session and a survey for you to provide us feedback and future topics. So you have a great evening and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Have Bye. a good evening. Bye. Thanks everyone.